at the book of Proverbs. Chapter 19, 13. We're going to look at verse 12. And we're going to look at 19 through 21. And we're going to do it from the New Living Translation. So if you don't have that one, we brought it to you. So let's read that one together. Proverbs 13. Verse 12, you can put it on the screen now so we can read together. Ready? Read. Let's do it again. Let's go back to 12 and read it with a little bit more power. All right? Here we go. Ready? Read. Next verse. Next verse. Trouble chases sinners while blessings. If you're righteous, give him glory. I want to talk for just a few minutes tonight on a topic that's been bubbling and I want to talk it like it's in class. Everybody shout, dream nerve. Dream nerve. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time. Let somebody be saved. Let somebody be rejuvenated, be healed, be delivered. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you could keep playing that just like that. On August 28, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered a speech to a massive group of civil rights marchers gathered around the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Why I cannot quote that entire speech. There is sections of it, but I do want to repeat for our hearing. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trial and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and the ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands 
with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers, I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is our faith that I'll go back to the south with, with this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee, I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, he says, let freedom reign. Nineteen sixty-three. He he did that, but didn't see that. He dreamed it the day we're experiencing a percentage of it now. But he had the nerve to dream it in a difficult time. He had the nerve to dream it where there was nothing close like what he was even saying out of his mouth. He had the nerve to dream it. And as I was praying about tonight, the Lord started dealing with me about those of us inclusive that are going through times that are opposite of what you're dreaming. And he says, I want you to tell them, I want you to remind them that it's okay to have the nerve to dream. It's okay. Yeah. He says, it's okay to have the nerve to actually do something that nobody in your family has ever done. There's no pattern for it. There's no design for it. Nobody's ever done it before. He says, I want you to tell them, I want you to infuse something in them tonight to get them to understand you have the nerve to dream. You can be whatever you want to be. You can go wherever you want to go. You can do whatever you want to do, but you cannot put the limit on yourself because of what you're in looks opposite of what you're dreaming. So I started thinking about it. And immediately in my mind, I start looking at the fact that scripture, when it opens up saying that hope deferred, makes the heart sick. And I started immediately, I said, well, I want to talk about dream wars right in the beginning. Because as soon as you start thinking about what God has put in your spirit. Thinking about what you want to do and start trying to put lens to it. Start trying to find focus it. Start trying to do what you want to do. You have an internal war that immediately rises within you. People from the outside may say whatever they want to say. That's good. But it's what we say to ourselves that causes an inner conflict that is difficult for us to rise beyond. So when you start having these ideas that God's given you and you want to start pressing it and putting it on paper, it becomes you that creates your own boundaries, set these imaginary rules to make you think that you can only go so far. But tonight we want to break that. Tonight we want to expose that, but we want to look at it and really dive into it because of what he's saying when he's talking about deferred hope. So I want you to get your pens out because we're going to talk it like we're in class. Deferred hope. Somebody shout deferred hope. Defined as this. A long drawn out time that extends beyond the comprehension of our expectation. Now, when you marry unmet expectation, high anticipation, and the time you have waited, sometimes it would shift to a feeling of time out. 
Sometimes it will shift to where you feel like you're out of time. That you're too old, you've, begun, you've gone beyond the scope of time for you to actually do what you dreamed about. And sometimes you question yourself, well maybe this, this is not God, well maybe I missed my window of opportunity. And if you're listening to the wrong people, you will switch and move beyond your dream into somebody else's dream. Touch somebody and say, stay with your dream, stay with your dream. The interesting thing about this deferred hope is that when you take that unmet expectation, you take that high anticipation, and then you take that span of time, the thing that it produces is a sick heart. It can produce, let me rephrase that, it can produce a sick heart. A sick heart isn't sin, but a sick heart can be deadly. A sick heart isn't wrong. It's just a response to an unmet expectation. It's a response to a high anticipation. It's a response to you not getting the answer that you think you need. But what is that sick heart? I want you to take the note. It's a place in your thoughts. It's a place in your emotions, in your entire being. It's a level of suffering that will take life from you. It is how hopelessness is born. It is a feeling that will pull things from you every single day. And as a direct consequence, you start removing yourself from people that you love, places that you normally go, things that you normally like to do. You start going backwards in life because of a sick heart. And I'm not the only one that's been in a sick heart. I, I've had some days this week where I felt like my heart was sick. But he's not, he's not literally talking about the blood pump. He's talking about your mind. He's talking about how you process. And you start processing things differently. Well, what happens? Trauma is born from a sick heart. Let's keep going. We have to discuss trauma if we're going to talk about a sick heart because all that is is a state of hopelessness where the sick heart begins to emerge and then trauma is born. And when the trauma is born, simply write this down, there is a complexity of the faith experience. Okay, there's a complexity of the faith experience evident from psychological research. Now, this is real truth. All right, I want you to take this. Suggesting that specific beliefs are related to poorer coping skills with stress or that religious stigma negatively impacts a person with mental health conditions. Watch this, this is truth. 90.4% of African Americans report use of religious coping in dealing with mental health issues. Watch it, in other words, blacks, go to church instead of going to counseling. We get addicted to the message, we get addicted to the messenger, we get a quick fix and church becomes a narcotic. And we go to the altar, which nothing is wrong because I am a deliverance preacher. But after deliverance you still need some psychological development. So there is a term called cognitive distortion. Cognitive distortion. You still with me? What is that? When you overgeneralize something, you take on isolated, an isolated negative event and turn it into a never-ending pattern. So it doesn't matter where you go, doesn't matter who you work for, and it doesn't matter who you date, the pattern continues the same. So we can move you out of one place, but you still end up with the same circumstance, the same issue, because there's a pattern. It's another term called a trauma loop. So it continues and continues and continue, and you live your life on replay of negativity. So it doesn't matter who you're connected to. It doesn't matter if you get a new chance, you get the same results, the same feeling, the same emotion, 
you keep repeating it over and over and over again, and then you're getting mad with God. It's not about getting mad with God. It's about you taking time and to understand your heart is sick. But we, we don't want to admit that we're sick. Because to admit we're sick is almost like we are, 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 are letting God down. And so I'm talking about those of us that are in church because we do preach about by his stripes we are here. We're supposed to confess it. We do confess those things that are not as though they were. But then we'll move so far that we get away from reality that you don't ever get a chance to confess your real feelings. And so if you tell the truth, you feel like you let God down. You don't let God down when you tell the truth about where you are. It's when you tell the truth about where you are, then now God can work that thing in your life. And now you can be honest to whomever your therapist is to help you work it out. Mind, body, and soul. Somebody shout hallelujah. So you become at war with yourself. You don't even trust your own dream. And better yet, you don't even want to dream anymore. I just had that conversation. I won't say any names. But the person told me, why dream? What I'm in right now, I hate. And it has sifted every ounce of try, every ounce of even wanting to wake up in the morning. You talking about dreaming? I'm just trying to sustain. I'm just trying to wake up sane. I'm just trying to keep from blowing my head off. I'm just trying to be normal, whatever that is. And you got the nerve to ask me about a dream. That is a dream war. Yes, and it becomes difficult for you. You want to go back to college, you're at war with yourself. You want to get into real estate, you're at war with yourself. You want to start dating again, you're at war with yourself. You're trying to move to another city, you're at war with yourself. You want another job, but you're at war with yourself. Progress becomes difficult when you're at war with yourself. It becomes impossible for you to move because you have to be in agreement with you for you to even be successful with where you're going. So what is a dream? A dream is a cherished aspiration, it's hope to achieve something. It's a series of thoughts and images that you have in your mind. When your dreams stem from your unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind and your conscious mind collaborate together. Your conscious mind is like your CPU. If I ask you about rice, your conscious mind sees the grain. Your unconscious mind starts thinking about all the different foods that rice can make. Your unconscious mind is not bound by anything. Your unconscious mind takes over when you go to sleep. Your conscious mind rules while you're awake. Your conscious mind can almost hinder you because your conscious mind hears the facts and will go beyond it. But I think it's interesting, because when you think about God, I don't think he's regulated to the conscious mind. He can't be regulated to the conscious mind if he can do abundantly above whatever I could ask, think, or imagine, according to the what? Power that worketh within me. If I limit the power to my conscious mind, then I'm not very powerful. But if I move the power out of my conscious mind into my subconscious mind, then I become somebody that's difficult to deal with because it takes the unconscious mind for you to believe you can walk around walls a few times a day and the joke will fall down. The conscious mind will tell you, no, I gotta have a jackhammer. No, I gotta have somebody to help me break this thing down. I need a tractor, I need a bulldozer. But the unconscious mind will say, I can believe without seeing. Are you here with me? 
the subconscious mind takes over while you're sleeping and takes over and you can find yourself being Superman and Wonder Woman in your dreams and you're trying to figure out what would it be like if you set your faith in your subconscious state and come out of that conscious state where you're only limited to what you've seen. But if you can start believing God in a space where there are no boundaries, have I got a witness in here? Look at somebody and tell them there's no boundaries to my faith. I believe God can do absolutely anything. That's a subconscious mind. The conscious mind will make you feel like, well, he can only do this and he can only do that. But when I set him in my subconscious mind and I dream about him, wish I had a witness in here, then I can start walking on water. Have I got a witness here? How do you believe like that? Because my conscious mind and my subconscious mind are collaborating with each other in the faith. I'm teaching in here tonight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I start thinking about it. You don't have to have many dreams to be incredible. Yes, Tell somebody you don't have to have many. Yes, Check this out. Genesis 28. If you got it, you're going to help us with it. Genesis 28, 11 through 13. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stop there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. And as he slept, what did he do? He dreamed. He dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth up to heaven, he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood who? The Lord. And what did the Lord say? Come on, read it like you know him. What did he say? The God of your what? Abraham. And the God of who? He said, the ground you're laying on what? I'm giving it to you and who? Tell somebody that happened in a dream. But how many dreams that do we have recorded about him having? One. He only has one dream all of these years. And this one dream set him up for destiny. Do you hear me? It reminded him of his history and then it told him about his destiny. He says, I am the one who knew your father, but I'm also the one that knew your grandfather. And I'm telling you what I told them that you're going to be blessed, 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 blessed. And he only had one dream. Touch somebody and tell him, you don't need five. All you need is one. He said, where you lay. It belongs to you. How would you feel if you had a dream tonight and God told you where you lay, it belongs to you, dead free? Tell somebody, it can happen, it can happen. How many dreams? Look at somebody tell you one dream away. See, that ain't no good neighbor. I need a real good sanctified neighbor. Tell somebody else, you one dream away from owning everything you ever wanted to own, from becoming who you want to become, going where you want to go, doing what you want to do. You're one dream away from doing everything that you've ever desired in your heart. You're just one dream away. You don't have to have it all together. God's going to put it together in the dream. So I said, wait a minute, that's good, Jacob. That's good. I said, what about Joseph? Genesis 35, 37, five through nine. Give it to us. It says one night Joseph had a dream. Somebody say, what? A dream. And when he told his brothers about it, what happened? Amen. 
You got it? Go back, let's read it one more time. One night Joseph had a dream and he told his brothers about it. Before we move, always know there are people that will be at war with the dream God gave you. So you have to anticipate warfare when you dream. You have to anticipate attacks and the shame of it is you got to anticipate it from those who live right under the same roof with you. Cousins and uncles and nieces and daughters and first friends and second friends and first cousins and third cousins and 18th cousins and, and enemies and everybody else. When you open up your mouth and start talking about the dream that God gave you, you got to have real nerve. I wish I had witness here because your haters, your enemies are going to attack you because you have the ability to dream in a circumstance that you're in. How can you dream and you don't have any money? How can you dream about owning a house and you live in an apartment? How can you dream about being debt free and you owe more money than the bank? How can you tell somebody, I'm still going to dream about it. Let's go back. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly my bundle stood up and your bundle all gathered around. And did what? Bowed low before mine. Read, let's go, read. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will what? And what happened? Did y'all see that? They hated him more for telling them the dream. Soon as he told them, first he told them he had a dream, they got mad. Then he told them what the dream was, then they hated him even more for telling them. In this season of dreaming that you're going to have nerve for to, to do this thing that's going to create all of this hostility, but at the same time blessing, you also have to be very, very sharp about who you share it with. That the dream that you have has to be protected. And sometimes you got to protect it from the people you love the most. His brothers responded, so you think we're going to do that? Verse 9, soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Seemed like you'd have learned the lesson the first time. Now it's easy for us to laugh at him, but we all did the same thing. Listen, I have had another dream. And 11 stars bowed low before me. So he's sharing his dream. And when he shares his dream, he attracts attack from his own people. So you have to understand that if you're going to have the nerve to dream, have the nerve to protect it. Have the nerve to handle the response from those that you love the most and even from those who hate you the most. Yeah. You have to put yourself in a position that as you begin to have the nerve to step into this new season of your life, don't pull back because war came first. If you're not gonna fight for it, you don't need it. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. Yeah. Say what I said. If I'm not going to, then what? Now tell the person sitting next to you, if you're not going to fight for it, you don't need it. If you're not going to fight for it, then you don't need it. Now here's what's interesting to me. Here's what's interesting to me. When I start thinking about dreams, the interesting thing about dreams 
is that if God gave you a dream, then the dream came from his dimension. The unseen realm. And the way to make the dream visible to you is to talk to you in a realm when sometimes you can't question it. So he'll plant it with pictures in your mind. And he'll set it in your subconscious mind and you'll see it and then it's your job to put vision to what he showed you from the unseen realm. And so what's coming from the unseen realm is trying to tell you I'm trying to get what's over here, over here. It doesn't do me any good to keep it here. So what I'm trying to do is deliver it the way I know how in a spiritual way so that you won't question it. So I'm going to deposit it into your spirit when you sleep. I'm going to let you think about it. I'm going to let you dream about it. I'm going to let you ponder on it. I'm going to let you sit on it. I'm going to let you read it. I'm going to let you think about it. I'm going to let you roll in it. I'm going to let you ask it. I'm going to let you become your own star in it. I'm going to let you see yourself in this position, in that position, and this position, and that position. And when you wake up, you're going to say, I can be absolutely anything that I want to be because it's coming from the inside. Nobody told you, nobody put it on you, he put it in you. So he puts the dream in you. And if that's the case, I want you to take a look at 1 Corinthians 2, I believe it's chapter 10. If you got it, you can put it on the screen for us. Yes. But it was to us that God revealed these things. By what? For a spirit does what? And shows us what? What he put in you was his secret. He didn't give it to anybody else. It was his deep secret about your future, about what you could become, about what you could do. And because it's deep in him, he places it deep in you, deep to deep. Next verse. No one can know a person's thoughts except that the person's own what? And what else? No one can know it. This is a spirit to spirit association. Watch this, read. And we have received God's spirit, not who? So we can what? The only way you're going to know it is by the spirit. Your flesh is going to question it. Your friends that don't walk by the spirit are going to question it. Your flesh that praises God physically is going to question it. So God has to plant it like he planted in the Garden of Eden so it can grow up inside of you and come from the inside out because he wants you bigger on the inside than you're on the outside. Somebody shout hallelujah. So somebody say it again. The dream God gave me is from his dimension. So, it is my job, once God gives me the vision, once he gives me the dream, is to put what? Vision to it. This is how people start seeing what he planted. Let's look at uh, Proverbs 29, 18. I'm in the message version. Proverbs 29, 18 is the message version. If people can't see what God is doing, this is the scripture, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Did you hear that scripture? Let me read it to you again. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, 
they are most blessed. You are at your optimum place when you will attend to what he revealed to you. So when you fix your focus on what he brought from one dimension into another dimension, you become internally focused. And what's going on around you externally begins to descend because the word that's in you starts ascending. You tell somebody, I'm at my most blessed when I'm attending to the revelation that God has given me. That's how you stay focused. That's how you can have mess going on all around you and not even see it with your eyes wide open because I'm internally focused on the dream that came from the secret place of God that he's trying to pull out of himself because he wants all of these secrets to be revealed in the earth. So then, in essence, the reason why there's so many mysteries about God is because we won't pay attention to the revelation that came from the secret place about God. So you take the mystery and materialize the mystery and then everybody starts saying, oh my God, how did you get that? What's your testimony? God did it. What do you mean God did it? That gives you an opportunity to tell your story about how you would, how you would sleep at night and your unconscious mind told you that you was going to own a billion dollar corporation and you was already $200,000 in debt and you wasn't living in a house, you were staying in an apartment with somebody else but all of a sudden you had a dream that you had a tech company and all of a sudden you were doing businesses with all kind of people around the world and you saw yourself in your dream not in a Bentley but in a boardroom I wish I had a witness here and you start talking about what he showed you and you pulled it from the deep and put it on the board and somebody said I want to partner with you where did that come from it came from my dream that I had nerve to materialize are you with me my God today so what keeps a person what keeps a person from seeing what God is doing I, I, I gave them something to put up there I hope they got it y'all have that slide I gave you not that one it should be the slide that says what keeps a person from seeing what God is doing so if you see this now, it's easy for you to take a picture of it. If you do that, you're not going to remember it. But if you type it, you're going to remember it. What keeps a person from seeing what God is doing? Despising the prophetic. When you don't believe what God is saying, because God is speaking from the spirit dimension. So you, when you don't believe in the prophetic, you're not going to know what God is doing. Don't quench the spirit. That's where the secret came from. That's where your dream came from, the secret. He says, don't despise, don't despise prophetic utterances. You got to get past the place where you don't believe what the spirit is saying. The scripture says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying unto the church. The Spirit will talk to you. He will talk to you. He will talk to you through the man of God, through the women of God, through the wind, through the mountains, through the rocks, through music. Don't limit what he's saying through an auditory or, or, or an oration on Sunday morning. He will talk to you through a song. He will talk to you through a dog. He will talk to you through a cartoon. He will talk to you through somebody vacuuming the carpet. You cannot limit what the spirit has to say to vocabulary words and I wrote down this so you can put in your notes it's hard to appreciate what you despise if you despise it you won't appreciate it and if you don't appreciate it why would he continue to evolutionize you why would he evolve you if you're not going to do what he told you from the start? 
Why would you believe him for another dream when you won't believe him for the first dream? Number two, PMI. It's like a mortgage, you know. Wrong slide, everybody. So, PMI is planning and motive issues. Okay? That's your planning and motive issues. Let's go to Proverbs 16, 1 through 3. Proverbs 16, 1 through 3. That is the New Living Translation. Proverbs 16. Do y'all have it? Y'all do? Let me hear you read it. I thought you said you had it. You lied in the church. I got it. No, you don't. You got it? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Oh, you're reading the thing real good, too. Okay, but I want you to read it real loud. Say it again. She said, we can make our own plans. But the Lord gives the right answer. But the Lord gives the right answer. All right, read. People may be pure in their own eyes. But the Lord examines their motives. The, the Lord examines their motives. Now, pause. One of, those things, one of the reasons I love this scripture is because we like to put that on somebody else. Yeah. You got to put that on you too. You think you're pure, God's judging your motives. Quit worrying about somebody else's purity and worry about your own motives. Read. So he says, commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Thank you. Y'all give, give her a hand clap for reading that word. So back to my original, my original slide, please, with the, the reasons people don't see. So my planning and motive issues, I got to make sure that I'm planning and that I'm talking to God. When God's given me these dreams and I'm having the nerve to birth something that's bigger than I've ever seen, bigger than anybody in my family, then I got to make sure my planning is right and my motives are right, all right? Uh, right and wrong is... Is, 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 uh, is common, but when you start stepping into some rooms that's bigger than you, uh, sometimes you'll be uh, uh, outgunned, and sometimes you'll feel like you have to be something that you're not. And I learned that coming here from our pastor. Uh, he put me on this Zoom with Timberland and some pastor that had like 15, 16,000 members, and then a doctor. And I was like, what you got me on here for? That room was bigger than me. But he told me, I put you in here for a reason. He said, they don't know what you know. So the way to be in the room is to be you. The way to win the room is to be you. They can't beat you being you. And then he told me, he says, you're going to have to learn how to have confidence in what he gave you. Yeah. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. It took me time. It's still taking me time. But now I'm starting to understand that there's no greater me than me. I'm the best me that there will ever be. And the only way to be greater is to sit in him. God, I got a witness here. And allow him to grow within me. And every day, I'll be a better me. Somebody say, better, 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 better. Oh, you got to shout it like you got power. Somebody shout better. Third thing, third thing is the lack of nerve. This is the reason why you don't see what he's doing. It takes nerve to tell somebody what he told you. I came here working an amazing job with an amazing church. And when I start telling people what I was about to do, they made me feel like I should have never said it. <laughs> but I know he told me to do it. Because he told me the way to better is for you to go plant yourself under better. Yeah. 
because I had maxed out who I could be on my own. So it would have been easy to stay on my corner and be what they call me and be that guy of my community. But I'm bigger than the community. Have I got a witness here? I'm greater than that city. God has something inside of me, but I had to have the lack of nerve. I had to have the nerve to step out on what God called me. All I'm trying to tell you is it's going to take nerve to do what he told you. If he told you to open up the business, you got to have nerve to do it. They're going to laugh. They're going to talk about you. They're going to scandalize you. They're going to tell you that ain't why you're doing it, but you got to tell them I'm not doing it for you. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them I'm not doing it for you. Tell them I'm doing it for me. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I hope so. So the lack of nerve. Let me tell y'all how good, let me tell you how much I have evolved. He used to scare the living mess out of me to see him over there. You see, y'all don't understand. All of us, we, we get through preaching, we get a phone call. What you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. And so when we leave here, we all have mile markers where we know we should get the call. And if you don't get the call by that marker, you start panicking. But when you sit on the better, better would challenge where you are. And then before you know it, nerve starts coming. And you stop being afraid and this power emerges from all of the training and all of the time and the believing God and trusting God and being scared and not understanding and not knowing if you're good enough. I came in here to tell you, you're way good enough. You're better than what you think you are. You got more power than you've been using. You're way more anointed than what you, somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, I wish I had a witness in it. Somebody say, I got nerve. I got nerve. If you're going to believe him for the best, give him glory. That ain't no real praise. That ain't somebody that's believing God for breakthrough. That's believing God for the supernatural. That's believing God for something challenging. Be seated. Sort of like a nerve. You're afraid to trust God's word. You're afraid to give God control. And you're afraid of what other people are going to say. All of us go through it. So you, you're not alone if you feel that. You may be at a different level, a different level of pressure. But the truth is, we all go through that cycle. We all go through that cycle. Uh, what is nerve? It's the courage. It's the confidence. Necessary to do something difficult. You're going to need it. You're going to need nerve to do something difficult. Now I want to show you something. I brought another slide of this article that I read. And in this article, by Debbie Gibson, she says, this is what happens when dreams do not come to pass. I want you to take it. She says, when they don't come to pass, number one, celebrate every accomplishment. Don't gloss over the moments looking for the ultimate goal. You gotta celebrate every single thing. You woke up saying this morning, Celebrate it. You didn't have to take any medicine this morning? Celebrate it. Your credit score may not be where you want to be, but that's all right. Celebrate. It didn't go down. Celebrate it. You got to celebrate it. You got to celebrate it. Then she says, go within. And I love this because she says, what society considers to be the pinnacle of success may not be yours. It may not be yours. Whatever they're saying, that may not be what God is saying for you. 
And so you got to spend time with God so you can find out what success is for you. The third one I love, she says, stop rowing upstream. You're trying too hard. She says, don't fight the big fight every single day. Glory to God. And then number four, change your mind. You don't have to keep that dream forever. Glory. She said, dream something else without reason. It doesn't have to be because you think it failed. Just change your mind if you want to. Then the next one, she says, be grateful. When you fall, and you will fall, pick up the pieces, learn the lesson, and don't worry about what other people think. Glory to God. Then she says here, take a break. Walk away for a while. Look at this next statement. Unfollow the dream. You don't have to follow it right now. Open up a space for a spontaneous opportunity. Just expect God to blow your mind with something else. Oh, I felt that thing in my soul. And then the last one she says, believe in divine timing. Bishop preached the message, timing is everything. It only takes one moment to go from dream to reality. This is why I'm trying to open you up tonight. Because no matter where you are, there's going to be a war as you have the nerve to do what God called you to do. Now take a look in this text and we're going to get out of here. If you go back to Proverbs 13, let's look at 19, 20, and 21 again. If you look at uh, 19, let's put it on the screen. It is pleasant to see the dreams what? Come true. But fools refuse to turn from evil to attain them. So it's a pleasant thing to, to get the dream and for the dream to come true. But fools whole turn. So the next point you're going to write down, I'm going to give you two of them, is dream submission. Dream submission. If you want to see something really happen in your life, then you're going to have to submit to the protocol of that dream. You can't navigate back and forth. Because as you submit, you're saying, I want this bad enough to sacrifice something else that I think I want just as bad. And so you'll get caught bouncing back and forth between two opinions. And before you know it, you're 31, 32, 33, 34. 35, 36, God gave you the dream when you were 28, now you're 38, 39, 40, now you put God in the place that he says, I gave it to you 12 years ago and it was a secret. So now I'm going to have to share it with somebody else because I wanted it in the earth and you wouldn't birth it. So this is how you wake up and you're like, man, I had that idea. I thought about that back in 1995. But what didn't you have? Nerve. You didn't have the nerve. You didn't have the nerve. Same thing happened with the disciples. You had 12 of them that had the nerve. There was 72 that said, yo, 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 we, we, this teaching is too hard. We can't, we can't rock with you, Jesus. And the Bible says that they left. And then what happens to Peter? Peter says, he says, yeah, y'all going to leave me? Peter says, where are we going? He says, you have the words of life. He had the nerve. The 12 that followed them, the scripture says, they forsook all. They had the nerve to follow him, so they had to submit to the protocol, the positioning to repurpose myself, to reposition myself, to replace myself, to do it a different way. You cannot dance with those who do not submit and understand submission. 
You cannot be with people who don't submit and understand the power of submission. You can't be with these people and then come over here and try to submit because they will taint your submission. They will make you question. They will make you examine. They will make you second guess. They will make you say, it's not worth it. When God planted you, he gave you the secret when you were submitted. Your submission is what allowed you to get the secret. And so you step out of submission, and then you're wondering why God's not talking. Because God's like, why would I share to a rebellious person? Because you think rebellion is just cussing out or, or not going. Rebellion is you choosing not to obey not to submit and you want to be a wonder instead of a servant okay somebody shout hallelujah so you want to be you want to have dream submission I want to submit to the dream sometimes you got to submit to training because if you're going to be better one of the first things and I love that he's here one of the things he told me when I first came here he says okay uh, he says you did good I hired you I brought you here I don't want you to I don't want you to think about uh, trying to impress me or trying to impress the church. I hired you. I said, yes, sir. He said, but, here's what he told me. This is not that. Uh, yes, sir. This is not that. That's what he told me. This is not that. He said, so, you got to get in here and understand the culture of this church. You got to get in here and understand the people in this church. You got to get in here and understand. You got to get in here and understand how we move, how we, how we go forward. You got to understand this is not that. He said, if it's going to, if this is this, then you should stay there. So if I'm going to submit, I have to adapt to being a foreigner and go through a season of strange. Yeah. And the only way a foreigner can make it is to submit to the one that's showing them. Teaching them the language, showing them the culture, helping them to understand how to move. If you want to have nerve to do what God has called you to do, you're going to have to submit to someone who already, already knows how to do it. So there will be a season in your submission where your strength isn't needed, just your support. Because you're not strong enough yet to hold anything in those rooms. But you're there because I know your future. Oh my God, glory to God. So you'll spend the season as a foreigner, you'll spend the season trying to figure it out, and I'm going to be honest with you, that season feels like hell. Do you know why the season feels like hell? Because you were good at this. I ain't talking about those of you that ain't good. If you ain't good, you ain't, you ain't understanding me. But those of you that was good at this, you were good at it. You became known at it. But then God, he elevates you, drops the seed in you. He drops a dream seed in you. And he says, you know what? It's time for you to go to another level. Then he takes you to the next level. You get into that level, but it's not time for you to stand and be this. It's time for you to sit and learn that. And so you feel stupid for a season in submission. You feel strange in submission. You feel like everybody's laughing at you in submission. But what you don't understand, you're actually being admired. You're going to have haters. They're going to, it don't matter. They're going to hate you in this. They're going to hate you in that. But people that are trying to go somewhere, they've been watching you. And you have been such an encouragement to them. 
because they were like, I saw you when you were doing it in front of three people. I saw you when you were doing it in front of 30. I saw you when your company only had a few followers. Now you've got multiple companies and multiple partners. I've been watching you and you have put a limit on yourself because you think you're not doing it as good as everybody that's sitting in that. But it was this that got you to that. And you've got to learn how to celebrate every small micro movement because when it's time for you to open your mouth in that, you will be able to run a track of what it took to come from this to that. But you have to be submitted to it. If you're not, I'm going to move and I'm going to get ready to go. Uh, look at the text one more time. Put it back up there. Put, can you put it back, please? <laughs> not that. The scripture, uh, Proverbs 13, verse 20. All right. Uh, go to 19. 19. He said, it's pleasant to see the dreams come true. Man, I, I want to sit on that come true for a second because you're going to get to witness it. <laughs> you hear what I said? You're going to get a chance to see it come true if you stay in a submitted place. It's going to come true. Touch somebody say it's going to come true. How do we know it's going to come true? Because it came from truth. He's the spirit of truth. All right? The spirit of truth released it from one dimension into this dimension, dropped truth into your belly. So it has no chance to be a failure. It's already truth. It was truth when it was planted. Are you hearing me? It was true when it was planted. All you got to do is go through the season of germination and you got to stay with it because truth has been deposited into your spirit. Tell somebody it's coming true. It's coming true. What he told me is coming true. What I saw is coming true. So what do you have to do? You have to survive the war. It's coming true. God. Put it back up there one more time, please. But fools refuse to turn from evil to attain them. Now, it's easy for you to say fools are unsaved people. So you put the foolishness outside of your belief system. Come on. But you, my brother and sister, can be saved and sanctified and a fool. How is it that you can be saved and sanctified in the food? Put it back up on the scripture. Put, it, put the scripture back on the wall. There's a simple reason, there's a simple way for you to determine if some of your saved and sanctified friends are being held in a spirit of foolishness. They refuse to turn from evil. So what are we saying? Third point. You got to take a dream turn. You're going to have to take a dream turn. There's no reason for you to know. That's why I'm taking my time and talking to you about it. For you to know that what he put in you is truth. It came from him. It came from his dimension. He takes the time, plants it inside of your spirit. Then he says, I want you to grow this thing. I want you to have the nerve because you're going to be hit with war. The only reason why you're going to be hit with war is because Satan himself knows that this comes from the same dimension that he came from. So Satan understands that what's in you is powerful. And if you could ever register that what you have in you is already true, he doesn't have to make it true. It is true. It's true before it ever materializes. It's true. So then what does he do? He ties you up with evil. So he ties you up with evil, and when he ties you up with evil, all he's simply doing is entangling you in the war that started in the first place. And that's why war comes first. 
because war is trying to discredit war is trying to discourage war is trying to disappoint and make you give up in the beginning and make you quit and make you walk away but I came in here tonight to tell somebody what you got in you is already true it's already in you it's already powerful it's already anointed it's already done oh I wish I had a witness in here Lean over and tell somebody it's already done. Oh, I felt that already. I felt that already. Tell somebody already. Tell somebody else already. Tell somebody already. If it's already done, I feel good in my soul. Tell somebody if it's already done, it's worth turning around for. If it's already done, it's worth taking a detour for. If it's already done, it's worth taking a time out. If it's already done, it's all right to stop in your tracks. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's already. Tell them it's already done. Have I got a witness in here? I just want to pause for a second and talk to some people that believe that it's already done. Grab somebody that's powerful. Grab somebody that's anointed. Grab somebody that's got the power to tell the devil, hell no. You can't have my future. Then. You can't have what God has for me. Because he put truth down in my spirit. Have I got a witness here? And tell that neighbor that I, I got the nerve to believe God in a strange place. I got the nerve to believe God with no money, with bad credit health bad marriage bad I got a nerd tell that neighbor I got the nerd tell them do you have it tell them if you don't have it push them away from me cause I If you believe him, give him glory. 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 This next praise is about to turn your future. It's about to turn your deliver. It's about to turn your circumstance. When I count to three, give God a turn in praise. One, two, three. Turn, 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 turn. Time on the said are we getting ready to go put the verse back up there next verse he said walk with the wise and become what you walk with if you walk with fools expect trouble go to 
at the next verse. But he said, trouble chases sinners. Look at somebody and tell them I'm tired of being on the run. He said, wow. Blessings reward the righteous. And I just want to know tonight, uh, where are the righteous? 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 Grab somebody and tell them I'm right. Tell them I'm right. Not because I act right. Because the righteousness of God was put in me. Have I got a witness here? Shake that neighbor's hand and tell them get ready because blessings are chasing you down. You're going to leave here blessed. You're going home blessed. You're waking up blessed. You're going to work blessed. Have I got a witness here? Somebody said you're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the field. Tell that neighbor it don't matter where I go. I'm going to always be blessed. The blessing ain't in the north. The blessing ain't in the south. The blessing ain't in the east. And the blessing ain't in the west. Ask me, where is the blessing? It's on me. Have I got a witness here? Tell that neighbor, the blessing is on you. No matter where you go, it's on you. If you're broke, it's on you. If you're sick, it's on you. If you're divorced, it's on you. If you're married, it's on you. The blessing is on you. The miracle is on you. The nerve is in you. Come on and give him glory. Keyboard. Oh, glory to God. Come on, praise him right there. No music. Praise him like you're blessed. Praise him like the miracle is chasing you down. I feel somebody's nerve rising. You're about to go for the deal. You're about to go in the boardroom. You're about to go for the loan. You're about to go for the house. You're about to go for the car because you got dream nerve. The last one, and we done. Just keep standing. We're leaving. You had the dream submission. You had the dream turn. You have dream companions. The Bible says they walked the wise. You walk with the wise, you become wise. So you want to walk with people who are already walking in the protocol and the position. They've already set the example. They're showing you how to walk. They're showing you what to wear. They're telling you what not to say. They're telling you what to say. I'm going to tell you something. And we're done with it. P uh, play on the keyboard for me. When I came here, and I always say that because I, I was already making great money. It was in one sector. It was in sports. So because our schedule is so busy, there's a lot of things I didn't get to do. And so I didn't, there were certain rooms I could walk in financially, but I still didn't know what to say. And so when I came here, it, it morphed me because he started taking me to banks. And, and I met my first king in this church. I had left. I was on my way home. And my phone was ringing. I said, hey, Bishop's looking for you. He was so many bishops looking for you, I thought I was about to get fired. <laughs> no, true story. Like nine people called me. I said, hey, man, I'm turning around. My God. Turn around. 
So I parked the car right out there. I ran in the church. Car was still running. And they said, hey, Bishop, waiting on you in the back right here. So I took off running. I'm walking. All the pastors are in the hallway. Bishop's in the green room with a king, like a real king. I've seen kings on TV. This ain't no king in real life. He called me back to say, I want you to meet the king. That's, that's all the reason he called me back. I just, I just want you to meet the king. Nobody else was in the room with the king. I was in the room with the king. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That was a spontaneous move that I was not expecting. I didn't meet the ambassador. I don't think he cared what I said. I met the king. Took a picture with the king. Sit in the room with the king. And all I did when I walked in the room, I just sit there. And I didn't know whether to move or not because he was talking to the king and I didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't want to embarrass him. But the queen mother liked the way I preach. So I'm standing over here in the corner like this and the lady that's with them is like, come on, come on, he want to take a picture with you. And I'm like, I'm not moving till he say move. I don't care what you say, he the king here. So I'm sitting over there like this. And then I looked at him and first lady says, come on. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Submission, 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 submission. Don't move till you're told to move. Don't talk till you're told to talk. Don't say nothing till you're told to talk to you're told to say something. Dress this way, dress that way. And so I moved over here and then myself and the queen mother took a picture with me. I never posted it, not posting it, it's for me. Yeah. <laughs> Dream companions, when you're with the right person, they'll introduce you to the right people. And you won't have to say anything. Them inviting you tells your future that you're coming. You don't have to say anything. Just show up. <laughs> 